mic test. You know, when you're leading here and the microphone did not work, something happens emotionally. Worship team, you did well. I'm here just to pray for Pastor Kevin as he speaks to us. But there's something that you need to get used to. Mrs. Ramirez is here. Yes, you can clap your hands. And Rose, get used to that in case you're not yet. But this is the first time I saw the Mr. and Mrs. at NLAC. But I want you to know the transition is happening. I'm so proud of this young man who will preach twice today here and in our Surrey campus. I simply would like to bless him. I was told by our lead pastor that he is watching and you are being watched. We are being watched and he is praying for you. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for this young man who said he will walk the talk of Jesus. And that's what we do in life. And in fact, that's not what we do. That is who we are now. I pray that as yes, he opened the word, that you will simply be able to express with love the word that you have given in his heart. And now it is in his mind and he's about to express it to your people. I pray that we, your people, will be ready, ready to listen and will be ready to do and obey what we heard. Strengthen and empower this young man. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Is the mic close enough to me? Okay. Good morning, New Life Alliance Church. How's everybody doing? Good. I hope you guys are doing good. It feels like it's winter in here, but it feels like it's summer out there. Hopefully it's not too cold for you. I know in the summertime, the ACs are always running, and I always have to remind myself, don't wear too thin of a shirt because I'm going to get cold. Um, and so hopefully the temperature is just right for you, cold enough to keep you awake, um, but not cold enough to make you freeze and not leave this place. So um, just to update some of you who are joining us today, um, this summer we're going through a new series, and it's a series on spiritual disciplines. So it's perfect that today we're talking about prayer, um, because, yeah, our pastors have wonderfully already discussed what worship is like, what scripture is like, and now we are entering into prayer. And prayer actually has a little bit of worship and scripture in there as well. And so I like how I was landed with this passage. Um, but before we begin, I have a very serious question. Very serious. No smiling. <laughs> When do you pray? Okay, when do you pray? You can raise your hand or you cannot raise your hand, doesn't matter. Um, I think most of us would say that we pray right before we eat. Yeah, do you guys pray before you eat? I feel like that's one of the most popular times to pray is like before we eat, we say, okay, Lord, we wanna thank you for the food. We bless this food for our body's nourishment. We have like this line prepared, right? Bless the hands that has prepared it. But there's actually rules with this. There's rules with praying for your food because I have yet to see a person to pray for our appetizers or pray for our desserts. For some reason, when we have chips and salsa and we're watching the game, watching right now it's the World Cups, there's Copa America and there's the Euros. How come when we're eating our snacks, we're not praying? But of course, family dinner, the family comes over and now we're about to partake in food, and all of a sudden, we're praying. Is there a rule with praying before we eat, or is it just for dinner? I don't know. Um, often we pray before we travel. As we've heard Pastor Ben, uh, he just came back. He was paying, praying for traveling mercies, and I feel like this is something we do often to pray for our safety. If we're going on a vacation, we're praying that nothing goes wrong so we can enjoy and not have heartaches and hardships along the way. What else do we pray for? We also pray when we want good weather. <laughs> this one's a good one because this is me, okay? 
I prayed so hard that on our wedding, when we got married, that it would be sunny. Because a couple of weeks before, it said it was going to be cloudy. It said it was going to be raining. I prayed so hard. And so my advice, if, you're, if you have a wedding coming up or you're getting married and it's an outdoor wedding, I'm going to tell you right now, that's the most the bride or the groom will ever pray in their entire life. Okay, I prayed so much, and God is good, and he answered my prayers, and it was too hot. (laughs) What's another time when we pray? We pray when we experience crisis. This was also me, or should I say my wife? You see, sometimes talking to God can be an emergency call. Something happens, and you don't know what to do except for call on God. And hopefully, in our heads, he's listening to us because our life has gotten this panic. I'm out of control. I don't know what to do in this situation, Lord. And we hope he's going to listen. We hope he's going to hear us and respond and move the cosmos in our favor that everything will be okay. And finally, sometimes we have someone we love so much, but what if they're making poor decisions in life? It's out of our control, and we just want to control the situation. Hey, go this way, not that way. But we can't, so we talk to God and see if he can somehow convince them to make better decisions. And so today, our sermon is on prayer, and we're also talking about spiritual disciplines. And so my hope for us today is We have a very popular verse. I haven't talked about it yet, but it's Matthew 6, 5 to 15. Some of you already know what that is. Um, And because some of you know what that is already, my hope and my goal for us today is not to teach us how to pray. Because you can look at these scripture verses, and Jesus himself will help us learn how to pray, a, a good structure how to pray. But today, my heart and my hope for us is that we can see the heart and reason why we should be praying. Why did Jesus pray? Why did Jesus give us guidelines on how to pray? I think often, sometimes we feel like we don't know how to pray. That's okay. Sometimes we feel like we're scared to pray. That's also okay. I love it when dinner comes along or a birthday comes along and someone taps you on your shoulder, it's usually your pastor, and he says, Kevin, can you pray? And I'm like, oh, me, I'm scared, there's so many people. It's okay. It's okay. Prayer at the heart of everything is our conversation with God, our relationship with God, and my hope again for us today is that we can see it from that light, rather than just me coming up here, here are one, two, three, four, ways that you can pray. Rather, why should we be praying? What is the heart in when we want to pray? Why do we even pray? And I hope that can be answered today through the word of God. And so if it's okay with all of you, um, I would like to pray for us one more time, and then we'll jump into the word. Yes, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just want to open our hearts to you. We want to open up our hearts and our ears to hear what is said in your word, to feel and see what is in your heart and what prayer truly means. What is the heart of prayer when we pray? And so, Lord, sometimes we might have fears and anxieties of praying out loud, um, but today, Lord, I hope you remind us and you give us comfort knowing that when we pray, We are first and foremost communing with you, having fellowship with you, and we are just spending time in your presence. And so as we go into your word, Lord, we just pray that you speak to us. Um, Anything that I have prepared that I want people to hear, Lord, may that not be it, but only, Lord, what you and your heart says to be heard today. We love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. And so, again, I want to just give us that idea. I want us to consider that we're not just going to be reciting the Lord's Prayer today, 
that Jesus had recited to us. Rather, I want us to really consider and gain the perspective that Jesus had with his Father. What was prayer like with his Father? And so if we go to our first slide, I'll read the verses here. So this is the Lord's Prayer, um, and this is Jesus speaking. And so verse 5 says this, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so I guess my first point is already there. Um, but I believe, I truly, truly believe that Jesus wants us to understand when he is saying these things to his disciples, when they ask him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. I think the heart of Jesus is not only to tell us these are some ways that we can pray, but his heart is what is going on behind the scenes. As it says here, I have highlighted a bunch of do nots. Do not, okay, do not. Prayer is not about being seen, first and foremost. You see, for the hypocrites, I guess a good example is like doing things for brownie points, okay? Sometimes we do things for brownie points, or we try to suck up to, like, let's say, for example, our teachers. The teacher might tolerate you and, like, not dislike you, but it's not a true relationship. You don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what is the true relationship behind that. It's only trying to impress. That is what's going on here. What else? Prayer is not what? About being heard. You see, for the pagans, it's like showing off that you can sing very well. It's like going to American Idol and saying, look at me, I can sing. And maybe you are a great singer. Yes, you may be able to sing well, maybe produce a wonderful album, but after a while, all of your songs might start to sound the same. Maybe someone's actually better than you out there. You see, what Jesus is trying to get across is that prayer, the heart, the true, true heart of prayer is more than words. Not the song, more than words, but it's deeper than just words that we say to God. You see, in this prayer, we can sometimes think that, or sorry, the pagans and the hypocrites can sometimes think that we can convince the Lord. Maybe if we say these nice words, we can convince God that we can have these things that we are asking for. Sometimes they might be thinking, if we just inform God, look at all our knowledge, look at all the things that we have memorized in your word, and we're saying it to you over and over again. We're informing the Lord. It's not just the words. Jesus is reminding us that we need to also connect with the Lord. What does it say in verse 6? But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, I'll give us a biblical example of this through the Apostle Paul. So I have another slide. And so... Paul, if you know, goes to, he's a missionary, just like the missionaries that just came back, um, and he planted all these churches. And while he was in Ephesus, this was written, and it says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord, Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you, he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength. You see, 
It's remarkable in all of his writings, Paul's prayers for his friends contain no appeals for the changes and circumstances that is happening in their lives. What do we know about Paul's time? They, people were facing persecution. There was death. There was disease going on. People, people, and kind, uh, people groups were being oppressed. Paul himself was in jail for his faith. Yet, in these prayers, you see not one petition. You don't see Paul saying, can we have a better emperor, a better president? You don't see him saying, can you protect us from these invading armies or even for bread for the next meal? Paul does not pray for the goods we would usually have near the top of at least my list of requests. What we see from Paul is what he believed was the most important thing God could give them. And what was this? What is it? To know him better. You see, Paul explains this beautifully the way he details it here. Having eyes of their hearts enlightened, in verse 18, as I've highlighted there. Biblically, the heart is the control center of the entire self. What does this mean? It's the place where someone has their core commitments, their deepest loves, uh, the things that control our feelings, our thinking, our behavior. You see, to have the eyes of our hearts enlightened means to have it penetrate and grip us so deeply that it changes the whole person, the whole heart. And so where am I going with this? Where is Paul going with this? Paul is showing us that knowing God is better. Knowing God better is what we must have above all if we are to face any circumstances in life. You see, Paul's main concern then is for the, uh, the people of Ephesus is their prayer life. He believes that the highest good in communion, in prayer, is actually communion and fellowship with God. Paul does not see prayer as a mere way to get things from God, but as a way to get more of God himself. Paul is teaching that for us believers, it should be the other way around. Otherwise, all the things that are going around, so in their time, again, oppression, being thrown in jail, being ready to be persecuted if you said you were Christian out loud, those things you would give up to. I would probably give up to. But Paul says, hang on. I think sometimes we're like praying at God, like, God, I need this. God, I, please like help me with this. Please help me with that. Rather than just simply knowing him in the midst of our praying. I think Jesus is trying to say here, and the heart behind prayer is not to pray better. I know the disciples, he's the rabbi, I need to do the way that you do. As John taught his disciples, Lord Jesus, teach us. But I think the heart behind Jesus' message is not how we can pray better. It's not how we can model our prayer to sound good or to look good in front of people. I don't think that's the goal. I believe the true heart behind prayer when we read these verses from Jesus, is to have a deeper connection with God. It's to have a deeper connection with God. You see, last summer we went through the Psalms. And when we went through the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms are prayers. And the Psalms talk about how we release to God how we feel and like all your feelings. Uh, David even asked like, I pray that your enemy, my enemy's skulls will be crushed to the ground. Like, express yourself to God. Connect with God. Connecting with God is just not a mere knowledge of him. Yes, Jesus is our Lord, Savior. He died for us 2,000 years ago. But it's not just in the mind. It's in the heart. It's an emotional connection with our God, too. It fuels our relationship with Jesus. You see, if we go out and try to live life 
and we say Jesus is in our heart and we don't pray, what do you think happens? Okay, I'll, I'll simplify this. We go out all day, we don't eat. What happens to you? You get hungry and slowly you'll get skinny and slowly you'll get sick and slowly you'll perish. In the same way, God, Spirit, who is in you, Jesus, who is in you, if you are not feeding that spirit, if you are not feeding your heart by praying with God, if you're not communing with God, spending time with God, that spirit is slowly going to die as well. Your journey and your walk with God is slowly going to perish as well. And this is what Jesus is trying to show us. Prayer is not, again, just words, things that you say. If you see Jesus in the Bible, he's praying every moment that he has. He's praying when he wakes up. He's praying after a long ministry. He's tired. He still chooses to spend time with his Heavenly Father. It is how we continue to grow in our relationship with God. And so, moving on, it fuels us, okay? The heart of prayer, what prayer does for our spiritual walk, for our faith, is that it fuels our relationship with Jesus. Without that fuel, without constantly being in connection with God, you're going to fall away from God. And so my encouragement to us is continue. Again, you don't have to have the best words. You don't have to say a long prayer. You, it's okay to be anxious. It's okay to be a little bit scared to pray now and then. But all God asks you is to talk with him. You don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to be shy. You're speaking to him as if he's your father, as if he is your father today, your, your personal father. He just wants to hear from you. Second point is that we need to understand the, the model of prayer. I think Jesus isn't trying to tell us this is the exact way that you have to pray. He's giving us an example of how we should pray. Notice when Jesus says um, in this passage, I've highlighted that the first four nouns other than when he's saying, okay, this is how you should pray, is our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your will be done, before it's anything about us. It's all addressing to God. And as I was thinking about this, this is how our prayer life should be as well. We shouldn't walk up to Jesus, hey God, Here's a list of things that I want. Give us our daily bread first. And then maybe if you forgive us, and maybe if you lead us out of temptation, then maybe I'll call you my father. Maybe then I will say, hallowed be your name because you've given all this to us. I think sometimes we do that and we mix things around. But God is saying, me first. And so as I was thinking, I was reminded that prayer is actually pulling us away from that idea. The desires of self-planning, self-decision-making, self-controlling our situations, self-everything. As Pastor Ben said, faith is not faith if we're just planning it for ourselves. We need to leave room for God. And what Jesus is trying to point to us through this, the Lord's Prayer is, everything first is unto God, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done before any of our lists of things that we want from God. When I was preparing for this sermon, I just, side story, uh, a special moment happened with me and my ina anak, which means my God child. So when I was thinking about putting God first and putting me after, um, one of my godchildren actually visited me this week. Um, I was working on my sermon, I was on the table, um, and he was crawling around the sofa, uh, he was crawling around the table, and every time he saw me, he would mumble the words, Nino. he's trying to say Nino, which means God, Godfather. He's like, Nino, Nina, Nino. And I know he's calling me. And I'll like look at him and I'll smile, and, like, <laughs> and I'm like going back to my sermon, like, I need to do this. 
But the move that got me every time, and I don't, I'm sure as parents you guys also can't resist, was the simple act of, Ninong! And then he goes like this, and I'm working, I'm like, I'm looking, and I'm like, I can't, I can't look. And every time in my head, what I was thinking was, oh, my mind's flowing right now, I have so many good ideas for my sermon, type, 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 type. And he's like this, you know. <laughs> no, I, I need to write down my thoughts, um, I need to keep working on my sermon, uh, I don't have enough time, not right now, but I just can't help it. Nino! <laughs> I can't help it, he's so cute. So what is prayer? When we think about prayer, how does that relate to prayer? I think prayer is moving from a posture of God, I've got this, to God, Dad, God, I trust that you got me. So from then on, every time he put his hands up, I took a break from my sermon writing, and I just enjoyed his presence. I played with him a little bit, and then when he started to get a little bit cranky or naughty, I was like, okay, take him back, take him back, and then I'll work on my sermon again. And then later again, he sees me, Nino, and then I, I pick him up again, right? So I would take a break. I enjoyed his presence, uh, my little uh, Inanak's presence, and I trusted that God was in control. Yes, I still had a sermon to write, but why am I trying to do this all on my shoulders, in my own strength, in my control, in my time? I can spend time with this this little child. And I think God wants the same from us. I think prayer is also just a lot of this. God, I need you. God, I want you. And I think the problem with us today is, again, we're always thinking about give us. Give us this. I think sometimes we have grown so independent from God that this position now is hard to do. It's hard to do because we're controlling our own life circumstances. Uh, when we want to control the circumstance of your day, like, okay, God, like, I have to do it this way. Or maybe you have life all figured out and you don't even think about God anymore. You see, it's so easy to think about God in our crises but when you have it all figured out, when you're okay and you're good, you don't need him. And so if we're going to pray like Jesus, I think it's going to require for a lot of us to let go of the things that we're trying to hold on to, things that we're trying to do by ourselves, and turn around and just say, God, you've got me. You've got me. And so when we pray, our Father I think we need to forget those things. Forget the false trinity of me, myself, and I. Give us this, give us this, God, give us this for... I mean, it's okay to ask God, but acknowledge your Father first. <laughs> there's, a, there's an order. When we pray, we need to remove that self-sufficiency. I can do it myself, God. And what did I do? I turned and just had time and presence with this child. In the same way, we should turn take a break from the things that we think is controlling us and say, God, I just want to be in your presence today. We need to remove this idea of I can do it all by myself. Self-sufficiency. Oh, I don't need you, God, because look, I've, I have a good income. I can provide for myself. I don't need to think about you. This self-abiding from our lives and really allow the true Trinity, which is God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in. As it says in John 15, because um, I said abiding, if you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see, again, just re-emphasizing what I'm trying to say. I think sometimes it's so easy for us to focus on that second part, the part that ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. However, Jesus wants us to fully submit ourselves, our circumstances, our situation to him, and he will answer in his perfect timing. Again, it's your name, your kingdom, your will, not ours. Rather than holding on to all the wants and all the desires that we have, 
I think we should be more open to God's plan for us than just our plans for ourselves. And when we allow God to work in our lives, we often start to realize, wow, actually God's plan was actually much greater than my plan. What I thought was really good, God is giving me something better. As it says in Proverbs 19.21, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. While we may think we know what is best for us, God has a better purpose for each of our lives that is beyond what we can imagine. And now when we pray, God give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us, something has changed. Rather than asking God first, God, give me this, give me that, give me this, then I'll bless your name. When we acknowledge God as the controller, as the God who is by his will, by his kingdom, by his plan, when we acknowledge him first, when we ask, something changes. Our hearts now align with God's heart. When we say God gives, what does he say? I provide for you. When we say, God, forgive us, it's, not, it's no longer, I'm, I'm do, I, I can't forgive myself. It's, no, God is our redeemer. It's no longer, God, lead us, like, I'll do all these good things and then you lead us. No, like, he is our guidance. Deliver us? No, he is our protector. The way we see God is different. He's our provider, our redeemer, our guidance, and he is our protector. And I think we wouldn't acknowledge that if we're just asking him first, God, give me this, God, give me that. It's a misconception to think that we provide for our own needs ourselves. And so at the heart of this, I truly believe that the model of prayer that Jesus gives us here, the Lord's Prayer, is not something that we just do. It's not just an activity. It's not just a ritual where we pray these things over and over again. I don't think that's the true purpose of what Jesus is saying. I think the model of this prayer is Jesus is trying to show us a lifestyle and guide on how we are to purpose our lives. When we purpose our lives towards this prayer, when we purpose our lives towards his will, towards what he is accomplishing, it will also happen in our lives. It finds out his will in heaven for our lives. You'll notice that the things that you want are actually things that God wants, and it will actually happen for you. It'll surprise you. And finally, to end, understand the condition of forgiveness. The Lord's Prayer is full of so much juicy meat, but I find it really interesting that he hits hard, heavy with forgiveness. From verses 12 to 13, and then even to 14 to 15, as it says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Sounds pretty serious. And so... I'll, end, I'll kind of start to end with this. Um, but I have a pop quiz for you guys. The only time in the Gospels that Jesus prays to God and doesn't call him Father is when? Do you guys know? It's a, good, it's a, it's a tough one. Jesus always acknowledges his Father, Abba, Abba, Father, right? But there is one place and it's at the cross. What does he say? He doesn't say, my father. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus doesn't take forgiveness and sin. He doesn't take sin lightly. And that's why he hammers home this idea of forgiveness. And so what is the condition of forgiveness? The condition is this. On that cross, Jesus lost his relationship with his father so that we could have a relationship with God as father. Jesus was forgotten so that we could be remembered forever. 
from everlasting to everlasting. You see, Jesus bore all the eternal punishment that our sin deserves. That is the cost of prayer. Jesus paid the price so God could also be our Father. You see, back then you would have to do so much just to be able to enter the presence of the Lord. But because of that day, we now have free access to speak to our Heavenly Father whenever. And so, why do we pray? What is the heart of prayer? What is the heart of what's going on here? When we pray, prayer is not only when we learn what Jesus has done for us, but it is from that place, knowing that God gave his life for us, that now we can also turn to our neighbor, turn to our enemy, and forgive them. That the same forgiveness that Jesus has shown us, we are now being called to show to others. It is from this understanding things change. When you pray, you're no longer just praying for A, B, C, D. Now you're praying for your family. You're praying for something that happened a natural disaster across the world. Your heart changes. It's no longer about you, but it's about God. And it stems from this place of forgiveness. When we understand what God has done for us, we start to pick up his characteristics. It's from this understanding our hearts now receive the joy that he has, the love that he has, his peace, and thereby we are also now being changed when we pray, when we pray to God, it doesn't only change the world around us. Yes, he listens to our prayers. Yes, he answers our prayers in his time, in his will. But now it's also changing us because we have been forgiven. It is changing our attitude, our behavior, our character. An example of this is my wife. You see, on my birthday, less than a month away from our wedding, we went on a bike ride and she broke her finger. And I stayed at her place. Obviously, at the time, I asked for permission from the parents. I slept on a super uncomfortable cot. and I would take care of her every day. But I made sure every day, every night, I would pray for her. I would pray for her. I would pray for a, a quick recovery. God, I pray for a quick recovery. I pray that come wedding day, she'll be okay. She won't be feeling any pain. La da la da for the weather, right, as I mentioned earlier. I prayed about everything. And even though I asked for changes in circumstances, even though I was praying that everything might be going my way, come the wedding night, she wasn't fully healed. But let me tell you, God was healing her. She was in the process of being healed. She never had to go back to the doctor with an infection or anything like that. Everything was in God's control, but maybe not the way that I wanted it. But it was by his will and his plan. And although we may pray to change circumstances in the world, from our loved ones, things that we don't see answers to right now, and it's tough, it's difficult, it makes us stay up late at night and we cry. Let me tell you, as much as Jesus does answer these prayers, because he did, he, he, my, my wife has a finger, her nail's growing back, she is healed. As much as he changes the circumstances when we ask and we pray for him, pray for these things, we are also changing because of Christ's forgiveness in our heart changing our understanding, our attitude towards those circumstances. If I was any other person, I would be pissed off, I would be mad. Some, I know some people who would be so mad and sad that they would probably call off the wedding. Like, I lost my finger, my, this is what the photos are going to be like? Let, let's move the date, let's change the date. This would have been me, this would have been Rose. But because we were spending time in the presence of the Lord every day, every night, asking God, even though he answered it, not in my time, 
He still answered it. She, her finger was healed. But the beauty about prayer is that when you spend time in the presence of the Lord, you as well are being changed. You are being transformed. And it is because you were forgiven and you've accepted that we have been, be for, been forgiven by God. And because of that, it changes our heart. It changes our perspective. I was okay with the wedding, or I hope you were okay with the wedding. She was optimistic. We didn't cancel the wedding. It furthers his kingdom on earth. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to teach you how to pray today. This is what the Lord's Prayer is for. It gives us a guide. It gives us a model on how we should pray. If you don't know how to pray, if you're scared to pray, Jesus prayed 66 words. This Lord's Prayer is short. You don't have to say a lot. All he asks is that you spend time in his presence. And when you spend time in his presence, something changes. Your prayer, it might be an answered prayer. A lot of pastors will say God will answer you in three ways. Yes, no, not yet. Let me tell you, God will hear your prayers. He will answer your prayers in his time. But not only that, when we spend time in the loving presence of Christ, not only will he answer your prayers, he will change your heart to be in the likeness of his. And when that happens, something special happens. And again, it will further his kingdom on earth. And so, just for a couple applications, maybe prayer is something new to you. Maybe you've never prayed before, or maybe you, you're, you have some questions like, is there some ways that I can pray? Well, again, Jesus gives us this model here in the Lord's Prayer. Um, but in my studies, I was reading a couple books, and I really liked this one way to pray that we can easily remember, and it's pray. <laughs> Pause, rejoice, ask, yield, and then repeat. It's a circle. You just keep going. And so if we go to our next slide, it is affirmed in the passage that we read today. You see, Jesus said, and when you pray, do not keep babbling. What does it say? Go into a room by yourself. Spend time with the Lord. Pause. If you're praying for the first time, you don't know what to do, just go into a place with no distractions and just pause. Just be in his presence. Listen. Maybe he has something to say to you. You are loved. And when we pause before God, as the song said earlier, be still and know that I am God, something happens. When we spend time in the Lord's presence, he will speak to us, maybe through his word, maybe just affirmations or people to pray for. Second, rejoice. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Rejoice. We pray to God. We pray how great and wonderful our God is. We rejoice that we live in such a beautiful place like North Vancouver. We rejoice that we have family. We rejoice that we have all these things, and we all give our due to the Lord. We rejoice. And then after we rejoice, ask. God tells you, ask whatever you want. I will listen to you, and I'll give you an answer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us today our daily bread. You see, when we rejoice and we ask God, he listens to us. He'll affirm you. Ask God, and he'll answer it if it's according to his will. And then yield. Pause. Pause again. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The final step of prayer is surrendering to God's will. We do this when we pray, listening to his word. To yield to God involves surrendering our wants, our desires, and acknowledging that his ways are often better than ours, not often, always. 
and that our very lives are living sacrifices for him. So this is the word of God today. Um, worship team, you guys can come up and I'll, I'll pray for us. <clears throat> Yes, Father, as you've guided us, as it says in your word, O Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, we ask that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, also give us today our daily bread. This is us acknowledging that we are dependent on you. We don't sustain ourselves, Lord, but you sustain us. And so, God, we ask that you give us our daily bread. And finally, Lord, we ask that you forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Lord, you have shown us what the true meaning of forgiveness is. And Lord, as you have shown us, you also challenge us to do the same for us. So, Lord, as we looked into your word today and what you might see in the Lord's Prayer, we pray and remind ourselves as we go out today that prayer isn't just words, isn't just saying fancy fancy things, it's not saying a lot of things, but it's what is in our heart. It is our love, it is our cry of compassion of who you are in our lives. And so, Lord, we want to acknowledge that when we pray, again, it's not just about words, but it's about you. It's about being in your presence, Lord, just being, spending time with you each and every day to open our eyes, our spiritual eyes to the things around us, things that we might not see from day to day when we spend time with you. Lord, thank you for reminding us that prayer, the the Lord's prayer is not just a bunch of words. It's not something we should just do and recite. It's not something that just stays in the mind, but it drops a couple feet down into our heart. Prayer, Lord, is aligning our hearts to your heart. Lord, we pray that we seek and urge and earn for the things that you want in our lives, Lord. We get so caught up in the busyness of life that we chase the things that we want, chase the things that you do, that we forget about you. But Lord, you remind us, oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, you are in control. This is your kingdom. You give us this life. And so, Lord, we offer our lives back to you. And finally, Thank you for your forgiveness. We are forgiven so that we can also forgive others. And through that, Lord, you transform our hearts. When we spend time in your presence, we no longer think about ourselves, but we think about the ones that you love. And so God, as we go out of these doors today, We pray for forgiveness for what we've been doing. We pray for any bitterness that we may have against our neighbors. Lord, remind us to have and continue to be transformed into the likeness of you. This is our prayer today. In your name we pray.
sees that I 